Okay, so let's look at it. I'm struggling where to put my book. Anyhow, the note the difference as you as you look through. Obviously, all the terms you have to know. The flip through here real quick and, and look at the anatomy and bring up a few things that I've seen and uh, get through the anatomy. So respiration. Remember, respiration is different than ventilation. Respiration is the process of gas exchange. So it's at the. Let me get this. I always have to say it slow. It's it's respiration. So you have the al alveolus and you have air. Let me draw. That makes me feel better. So you have the bronchial coming down that obviously has blood in it. And don't forget, in between that space, because it'll be important later on, that you have a fluid level here. Okay, you have fluid there, serious fluid. Not like serious, but serious fluid. Okay, so you have fluid there, and gas exchange will take place here so the oxygen that you just took a breath in will pass through the fluid, through the capillary, because it's a thin capillary, so it's permeable, no, permeability. You get, you know what I mean, okay? And you have that, and then it's in there. This, in this capillary, in this pulmonary capillary, it's high in carbon dioxide, so that is going to transfer back in there. If there is a problem with this process here, okay, this is respiration. So if there's a problem with this process here, that's where we get into that VP mismatch. Ventilation for the V and Q for perfusion. So we get into the ventilation VP mismatch. It could be a clot, it could be blood, it could be excess fluid like from CHF. Uh, it could be a difference in pressures, pressure difference, but you have a problem there with ventilation perfusion. It's not perfusion the gas pressure. So this is respiration here. Ventilation is just the process of bringing the air from the atmosphere into the lungs, right? Uh, there could be a problem there. You could be getting into a little, like an, up, uh, an obstruction, an upper airway obstruction partial obstruction or a full obstruction, you're not being able to get air from the outside to the inside. So you, you sort of run into a little bit of a something to do there. Just note the difference on the, uh, there's a couple words that I don't use, this external respiration, the gas exchange between uh, the alveoli and surrounding pulmonary capillaries. That's what we just talked about. Then internal respiration is between the the capillary and the tissue. Okay, so external, internal, and then that's just uh, look at those vocabulary. Note there the the figure there with the upper airway, the different parts: the nose, the mouth, the throat, down to the epiglottis, upper airway. Right, that's where. You could have a problem not being able to get air in when you look at the upper airway. And we know the parts, right? So we've already been through the anatomy. As we get down, as we start going down, you have the thyroid, the, the, the thyroid cartilage here with the Adam's apple, is it sometimes called, not by us, but by others. Okay, so you have the Adam's apple and the thyroid on the side of that. Uh, and then below that, the vocal cords, the trachea, you get into the uh, lower airway. Remember the trachea, the, the, it has those C ring cartilage to hold it upright. <coughs> the esophagus posterior doesn't have the cartilage in it. It's just a, sort of a tube where the trachea is held upright by a cartilage. You guys have held the trachea before, right? So you, you felt that. And then you go down to the bronchus where it splits at the carina and then goes into the uh, the bronchioles. So the mechanics, everybody good with anatomy, right? I mean, we just took the anatomy test, so hope, hopefully so. So the mechanics of ventilation, uh, you have two different parts, what I call the mechanical part of respiration, right? And, and there's probably a better term, but the neural part of respiration, 
in, in this strip should be reviewed for you. Remember, you have atmospheric pressure out here, which is uh, at sea level is 1,600, 760 millimeters of mercury. All right, let's just say we're at sea level, and you have an intrathoracic pressure as well. And whatever that intrathoracic pressure, there's a good picture in your book that sort of shows it. Um, 222. Okay, so if you sort of look over there, that'll, that'll help out a little bit with this. But what takes place here is in order to take a breath in mechanically, the mechanical function of it, what we have to do is we have to get the intrathoracic pressure lower than the atmospheric pressure because gas always moves from what? High concentration to low concentration. Right, high concentration to low concentration. Depending, no matter where it's moving, that gas ball is a law, so it moves that way from a high concentration to a low concentration. So what we have to do, we have to get this intra, intrathoracic pressure lower than atmospheric pressure. The way that that takes place is part of the, the neuro part of this. We have the respiratory centers in the, in the medulla, uh, medulla oblongata, like the water boy. Have you ever seen that? It's like an old movie. Yeah, I've never heard of that. Uh, missing out. Anyway, the medulla, on the brain stem, uh, and then on, in that is the pons, P-O-N-S, where the respiratory centers are. You have multiple respiratory centers, but you have the ones that control insul inhalation and exhalation, okay? So what takes place is, when the body needs to take a breath, uh, these respiratory centers send signals down to the breathing muscles, the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. And it does that by the fact that we breathe off a level of CO2, correct? So we, that's the uh, hypercarbon drive. This is what everybody breathes off of. Later, during respiratory emergencies, we will talk about the hypoxic drive which has a great mystery to it. Depending on the age of the person that's teaching about that, they're going to say, hey, the hypoxic drive is the backup drive and chronic smokers who retain CO2, they breathe on their hypoxic drive or they can breathe on their <coughs> hypoxic drive. That, that is true, but most of the time that they're unconscious, yeah, this has been mistaught for years. We'll talk about the hypoxic drive later. But, yeah, people are breathing on their hypoxic drive are usually unconscious. And they're unconscious due to such a high high retention of CO2, but it's taught sort of backwards. So we'll clear that up when we get to emphysema. But the hy hypercarbic drive, so these respiratory centers that are in the brain, they they get input from chemoreceptors that sort of spread throughout the body. There's chemoreceptors in the airways, and there's chemoreceptors in the aortic body, the arch of the aorta, and there's chemoreceptors in the carotid body, at the bifurcation uh, of the carotid arteries. There's chemoreceptors, which are specialized cells that sense Oxygen, they measure oxygen, they measure carbon dioxide, they measure blood pH, right? But since we breathe on the response to CO2, they're measuring carbon dioxide. Remember the normal CO2 is uh, 35 to 45, correct? Okay, so the normal CO2 is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. And what takes place is, is when we retain, when the body senses that, hey, a little bit too much carbon dioxide, so it's going to initiate uh, the response. And that's where, if you, if you read that physiology section, that, uh, what is it, the B, BRG, ventral respiratory group, you have the ventral respiratory group and the dorsal respiratory group. The ventral respiratory group initiates that response 
to the uh, the Admystic Center. And, and uh, once it does that, the Admystic Center and the DRG is responsible for inhalation. Right. So we're, the chemoreceptor sends the signal to the DRG, the ventral respiratory groove, and that groove and the agnostic center on the pond, okay, they send a signal to the respiratory muscles to contract. Okay. So that's what takes place. The, they send the signal down to the primary muscle of the respiration, the diaphragm, right? And so the diaphragm contracts downward and the intracostal muscles in the chest between the ribs push the rib cage outward. So you have a downward movement of the <coughs> yeah, diaphragm and an outward movement of the intercostal muscles. Okay? So when we look, do you want to take a picture of this? Or So these contract, right? So you have a certain pressure in here. Let's just say, let's just use the, I think the number in the book is 754, okay? So that gas law says, if you don't measure the volume, okay, of air, or the volume, that goes the same way in the blood, and when we talk about vessels, the same way in blood. If you don't mess with the, the volume, if you change the container size, you make the container bigger, what happens to the pressure? It drops. Right, it decreases. Good. Uh, so if we can if we change the container pressure here, the pressure is going to decrease. So we have a decrease in pressure. That through the contraction of the, the muscles, the respiratory muscles. It, it makes the container larger, okay? So we have a decrease in pressure, and it decreases below atmospheric pressure, and air will come in, okay? Remember that? That number's not good. I need to... Okay, so we need to decrease this number before, below atmospheric pressure in order for air to come in. And as we... As the diaphragm does its business and the, the intercostal muscle does what it does to make that thoracic uh, container bigger, pressure drops. Air is going to come in until when? It's going to, air is going to continue to come in until when? Hmm? Almost. Huh? High pressure. Okay, we made this, now we've made this lower, okay, by increasing the size of the thoracic cavity, so air's rushing in. Until that pressure's higher than the atmosphere? Until it's okay. equal, right. It's going to rush in until it's equal, okay, and then you have a, this coordinated effort with the other respiratory group, the pneumotactic group. And what's going to happen there? Because the pneumotaxic group is is getting signals from the stretch receptors in the airways, and the stretch receptors are saying, "Hey, you know, that's we, we're good, we're good, that's enough, right?" And along with the combination of these pressures, now we've got a big breath inside of us, right? And the, the neural part of this is the pneumotaxic center is going to send signals down to the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles, okay, the breathing muscles, and they're going to relax. So they relax and the diaphragm comes back up, the chest wall goes back down, the container gets smaller, now the intrathoracic pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure, and what's going to happen? So, you're back in the same 
inside. Yeah. You're going to exhale, correct. It's going, air is going to come out because the pressure, the intrathoracic pressure is now, let's say, 762 because we've shrunk, we've got this big breath, but we've shrunk the size of the thoracic cavity down by relaxing the breathing muscles. So we've increased the intrathoracic pressure, correct? above atmospheric pressure, so air went from a high concentration to a low concentration. Good? So we exhale. Okay, that's sort of the, the both of these together, they work with the, with the muscles to make this a smooth transition. Okay? Both, both rate and depth. That other uh, dorsal respiratory groove works with uh, rate and depth to make sure that there's a smooth transition between inhalation and exhalation. Okay. It goes off of a, I'm gonna, an I to E time. Inspiration and expiration. Okay. And these are two to three seconds. So what happens is these dorsal groups send signals that last for two to three seconds. And it, it, uh, it creates this I to E time, inspiration to expiration time. So just like the heart, everything has to work in the sequence, correct? So you have this problem here. Someone on a vent, a ventilator, if you want to really jack them up, you change the I to E time. Uh, either it, it looks horrible and the SpO2 and everything just goes crazy because you mess with those I to E times. Those have to be right. Like a respiratory therapist can manipulate those I to E times uh, to save oxygen or to to work on the patient's needs, right? So does, does everybody sort of everybody good with that? That's sort of a big review, right? We've we've been over a lot of that before. So that's that's the way mechanical respiration works with the brain, the, the brain stem to create the breathing process, 12 to 20 times per minute, correct? The normal respiration. Keep in mind that at rest, we only breathe really about 14 to 16 times. You go to sleep, you may only be breathing about 10 to 12 times per minute, really. Okay, and this is off of, uh, because this creates a different pressure, this is a negative pressure. We normally breathe off of a negative pressure. I'm, and I'm trying to remember that, that Khan video. I think it's Khan. He said because the way that the, uh, you know, the, when we take that big breath, it pulls, it pulls the bronchial open, but it's pulling against the pora. Uh, you remember the pora, the, two linings of the, the lungs. You have the visceral pora that covers the organ and the parietal pora that covers the cavity. It, it pulls against that, so it creates a negative pressure in there. I guess for a test question, we breathe off of negative pressure. We, uh, if, if that comes up, you know, how, how do we breathe? Negative pressure, positive pressure? We breathe off negative pressure. The, the physiology behind that is not really that important. You just have these two lines, the, the pora pulling against the uh, bronchial, to open the bronchioles and pull it against. That's why we have a pneumothorax that collapses, that problem collapses there. And an emphysema creates a bit of a problem as well. When next, next time, we'll use the bag valve mask, okay? And this creates positive pressure. So when uh, you see this on a test question, that it may be you want to ventilate the patient or you want to use positive pressure ventilation, it's the same. This is the same. So positive pressure ventilation or ventilate the patient, you're doing the same with the bag valve mask. We normally breathe off of negative, negative pressure. <coughs> Everybody good? Good review. Okay, a couple new vocabulary words. Well, one, maybe, uh, hypoxemia. 
that cell is hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is the, the lack of oxygen in arterial blood. Okay? It is critical. A patient with hypoxemia is, is in critical condition. Okay? Hypoxia, you got savvy hypoxia, right? Okay, you're familiar with hypoxia. Hypoxia refers to uh, inadequate oxygen delivery to the cells. So it's at a cellular level. The hypoxemia is at the arterial blood level. Hypoxemia is quite uh, serious. Then you have another term over here uh, that we'll get into in a couple of weeks, hypoperfusion or shock. Remember, perfusion is the body's ability to transport oxygen and nutrients to the cell, right? Hypo meaning that prefix hypo is what? Uh, below. below. <coughs> right, yeah, below. So you, it's below that. So hypoperfusion is the inability <coughs> of the body to uh, deliver oxygen and nutrients to the cell. I don't use the hypoperfusion too hard to say. I used to say, I used to say shock. Shock and hypoperfusion, <coughs> it's, it's the same word, okay? It's the same. You, you look in there, you see moderate and mild signs of hypoxia and severe signs of hypoxia. This is something that we'll get into more when we look at uh, respiratory emergencies, okay? One thing that you will, all, one thing that you will always know is that when you have difficulty breathing, the heart rate will go up. They're, they're um, not proportional, but what's that called? When one goes up, the other one goes up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying, but we don't have that. There's a word for that. That's I wanted the word. Come on, guys. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know. I don't either. <laughs> okay, so anyhow. So one goes up, the other goes up. Heart rate goes up, respiratory rate goes up. Heart rate goes down, respiratory rate goes down. In certain cases, some of them are backwards, but there's a problem there when they become backwards. That's for another day. Look over those signs and symptoms. Uh, cyanosis, the bleeding of the skin, right? Mucous membranes in the lips, fingernail beds, in the fluid in the eye, the white of the eye part there, around the lips. Cyanosis is a very late sign. It's a sign of poor tissue perfusion with uh, you know oxygen perfusion. It's a late sign. Don't don't think you're going to see someone that cyanotic early on. That cyanosis is going to be late. You have peripheral cyanosis, which is right around the lips and the fingernail beds. Now, right around the eye. Then you have central cyanosis. Central cyanosis, where you have cyanosis like on the chest and in the face. See, the face is blue. They look like a little smirk. Okay? That is very critical. That's, uh, those patients definitely need to be ventilated. And then cyanosis is also a sign that they're going to need oxygen or ventilation. It's, that's going to be one of the key things in, in this part as far as test taking is concerned. You're going to need to know the difference between when a patient needs oxygen and when a patient needs to be ventilated. Okay? The book does a really good job of, of giving you a description, and we'll go over that when we get to it. Remember the role of hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is to transport the oxygen to the, uh, to the needed tissue, okay? What about carbon dioxide? How's carbon dioxide transported? Pictures before we move on? Okay. How's carbon dioxide transported? The majority, like 70% of the carbon dioxide, how's that transported? It's, 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 it's like a hyper, no. It's just oxygen. It's like a hyper, 
Right arm. Right arm. Okay. So seven in inside the cell here. Okay. Uh, this this takes place inside the cell, and, and I'm I'm like buffering here trying to remember all this stuff. Okay, but we know that the hemoglobin is responsible for transporting oxygen to the cell. So you have a hemoglobin in four oxygen molecules. Consider that it's like a little bus. Okay, five can't get on there. Four, they sit on there. They have chairs. Everybody has to have a chair. Okay, where Carbon dioxide is broken down into bicarb inside the cell. This is called the chloride shift. Okay, and what's take what takes place is, and I'll find that formula later, but uh, it breaks down. If you have CO2 plus water that breaks down the uh, CO2 into bicarb. Where's bicarb? Bicarbonate. Okay, so you have bicarbonate. So what happens is between the water and the CO2, it breaks it down and the, the water uh, positive hydrogen ion into bicarb. Bicarb leaves the cell, okay? Bicarb leaves the cell and goes into the plasma and chloride comes into the cell in order to balance the, the equation. You, you have a negative going out, you need a negative coming back in in order for it to balance. If I could remember that formula, if you guys had chemistry before, you, you could you say, oh yeah, I see that, but I can't remember it off the cuff, okay? So carbon dioxide is transported 70%, is transported, uh, in the plasma, and then once it gets back to the lungs, it's a reversible equation. Then the reverse <coughs> takes place. The chloride leaves, the bicarb comes back in, and it's converted back into carbon dioxide, and then we go, right? Okay, so this chloride shift is very important. Without this chloride shift, we would have a buildup of CO2 because it wouldn't be able to leave the cell and change into the form of bicarb. You have to have the chloride shift there because uh, it will, you know, we have to keep things balanced, correct? Without that, then it won't work. There's, uh, I don't know, like 23% is transported on these peptide chains on the hemoglobin. They just sort of essentially ride on the bumper of the hemoglobin. So there's some that does transport back by the hemoglobin, but the majority of it is transported back through this chloride shift process as form of bicarb, bicarbonate. You did that last year, right? Yeah. Why don't you remember the form? Do you remember the form? No, don't remember the form. Why not? You have young mind. No? No? What? No? <laughs> I'll show you how old age or sucks. <coughs> is that we, we went over this like two days ago and I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. So where things where things start taking place is that, that goes wrong is where there's not a adequate elimination of carbon dioxide or an adequate delivery of oxygen, right? Does that make sense? So you, you're not, a, the body's not eliminating carbon dioxide or the body's not eliminating or getting enough oxygen or transporting enough oxygen. See, we have multiple problems here because we have a problem, we need to take air in, correct? Okay, so if we're not getting the adequate air in, which is what, like if I take one breath, I go, what is that called? <coughs> But the amount of <laughs> amount of air that I'm taking in, what is that called? Oh, tidal volume. Tidal volume. And the average tidal volume is what? 500 milliliters. Yeah, 500. So you have tidal volume 
500 milliliters. So if I'm not getting an adequate tidal volume in, then respiration becomes inadequate because I don't have enough air, right? I don't have enough volume. And then we have to deliver the volume, right? So we have multiple things we have to do, and that's where all the problems take place. Fortunately for us as EMTs, some of them are easy to correct, like hypoxia. How do you, how do you correct hypoxia? <coughs> Oxygen. Right. How do you correct inadequate tidal volume? Ventilation. Right. You have to bag them. They're not getting enough air in, so you have to breathe air in for them. Anyhow, there's some uh, cons special considerations when we get to pediatrics. We have a whole chapter on pediatrics. So, but airway-wise, uh, their, their tracheas are uh, more narrow. They're flexible. I mean, they're, they're really flexible. Every time I go to Whataburger and I get that small drink, I, get, I put the white <coughs> straw in there. The white straw, remember, has, has the one that bends back and forth. Next time you go to Whataburger, grab one of those straws and bend it back and forth. And that looks, that reminds me every time I do that of a pediatric airway. Because if you bend that airway back like, a, like an adult in a head tilt chin lift, if you bend it back, what happens to that straw? Well, it, it, it kinks off, right? So that's the same way the pediatric airway is. Pediatric airway, you have to keep them in a neutral position. Keep the straw straight or it's going to kink off because the trachea is uh, it's more narrow, a word? No, a word. Yeah, okay. So that, if you want to keep them in a neutral position. Also, they don't get as much air in. They don't get as much tidal volume as an adult, so they don't have the same amount of oxygen storage or air storage that we have, right? So someone that's an inadequate tidal volume for a pediatric is a ser more serious thing than an adult. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. right? So what is our auto -back? Yeah, when do we, like if we're considered adults, if we have the same tidal volume as you do, what? We don't. Do we don't because you weigh like 50 pounds. But <laughs> 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 you know. Okay. But, but like, like, like if for a child, the, their trachea is oh, yeah. when more flexible. When is it not flexible? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we just like, if we're in that situation, do we just. I, I would keep it to American Heart Standards until I can ask Google about it. Uh, I would say about eight. eight. Well, eight, what? So after eight, you do head to chin lift. Oh, okay. Uh, before eight, you keep them in a neutral position. <laughs> what if I have like a big six-year-old? Like a man child? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would, I would, a six-year-old, I would still do in a neutral position. Even if he was the size of Chuck. I'd still <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do a neutral position. Remember when, when you open someone's airway, and, and let's say that you're opening their airway, you're having to do this, you're going to ventilate them, right? You're going to use a bag valve mask. So if you have that, uh, that, that person that you're wondering about, do I keep in a neutral position or do I head to chin lift? I believe the answer is A. But uh, let's say that you have the, the man child and you go, I'm going to go ahead and do a head tilt chin lift. And I go to bag this guy, right? And I don't get good rise and fall of the chest. Okay? So I'm going to reposition that. I'm probably going to put it in a neutral position and then see if I can get good rise and fall of the chest. Does that make good, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so you have to sort of mess around with it. Us, we do a head tilt chin lift. I think it's eight. Question, 
how you feel. Yeah. <laughs> I would still evaluate that, however. You know, I imagine, uh, like when you were 10, I mean, were, were you really the size of a 10 year old? When, when you deal with pediatrics, you have to look at the size. I know 10 year olds, and you have beards. <laughs> I mean, you're looking at them going, You're 10? <laughs> Bubba, come on. And then 10 year olds like, you're really in school? Wow. You know, you're seeing the some somebody, you know, the like some of the freshmen walking around. Boy. Oh my god. I looked at them like, yeah, you're in the wrong school. I thought it was a freshman. Maybe he's like a Sheldon. He's really small. I think he is. Because like he's, he looks like he's from the Oregon. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. See, you, you have to evaluate that when, when you look at it. Like, do guys follow the test? They are. No, you know, <laughs> 10, 12. It really makes a difference when you start giving medication. Because all medication is weight-based. So you, you have to look at it and go, hmm. I don't really know. Anyway, other concerns, airway concerns, burns <coughs> to the face or trauma to the face, we'll get into that. We have sections over it, so you have to have some consideration there. You also have to have consideration when you when you have a child on a backboard. Sometimes they have these big heads, right? And so, <laughs> you know, it creates this, this uh, abnormal flexion of the head. Yeah, that's the effect, abnormal flexion of the head. So the head goes, the head's so big it pushes the head down like this, right? So you may have to pad around the shoulders and everything. You you would note that when you when you saw the kiddo, right? Okay. No. Everybody good with that quick, very very quick anatomy review? But we've already went over the anatomy, right? So uh, next time Next, not Friday, but we're listing Friday. Next time we'll get into the rest of this, okay? Questions?